Is menopause making you feel, well, less than sexy? Get your sexy back with Kindra, menopause essentials for the modern midlife woman. Welcome to Mastering Modern Midlife. I'm Catherine Grace O'Connell, and this show and season of Mastering Modern Midlife is sponsored by Kindra, menopause essentials, estrogen-free, by women, for women. I'm super excited to introduce my guest today. Katie Chin is a celebrity chef. She is a food blogger and award-winning cookbook author, and we're going to dive into her story today, which is pretty amazing, spanning from being a guest chef um, on Iron Chef, as well as uh, at the White House, for heaven's sake. So, so many amazing stories to get into today. Welcome to the show, Katie. So excited to have you with me. Thank you so much for having me, Catherine. And thank you for squeezing this in as you are like literally just about to hop on a plane to head to New York City and go live with Kelly and Ryan. Amazing. I'm super excited. Well, Lunar New Year is right around the corner. So it's, it's a pretty <laughs> crazy time of year, but very exciting. Lunar New Year is Chinese New Year. It is what, the year of the tiger? Is that what I... It is the year of the tiger. It falls on February 1st, 2022. And it's the most auspicious of all Chinese holidays because everything you do, everything you eat, everything you say determines how your whole year will unfold. Wow. Uh, not, no pressure here. We just want to make sure that we start the year on a super positive note. And a very positive note is this amazing new cookbook. Five cookbooks. Is that right? Five? This is my fifth. Amazing. So it is the Global Family Cookbook. And uh, what I love about this is we were talking a little bit before the show. I, like so many other women, men perhaps, um, was very intimidated to cook anything Asian. There was just this, uh, I don't know, it just seemed terrifying to me. But number one, this is not just Asian food. This expands all around the world to so many different recipes. But also, you really take the fear out. You are known for making recipes super easy, affordable, budget-friendly, and fun. So, um, and before we even dive into that, you weren't always a celebrity chef or an award-winning cookbook author, were you? There's a whole backstory to this, isn't there? Started with your mom. Yes. Well, everything I know about life and cooking, I learned in the kitchen from my mom. And uh, I love to share this story because it's so inspirational. Her story is just amazing. My mother immigrated from uh, China to Minnesota, where I was born and raised in 1956. She was a seamstress, literally making 50 cents an hour, but she always loved to cook. And then one day she threw a luncheon for some of her sewing clients and they were so blown away by her authentic Chinese food. They encouraged her to start teaching classes and to cater. One thing led to another, and um, she caught the eye of a local celebrity who wanted to open a restaurant with my mom. So, uh, in fact, this a local cele- celebrity socialite was friends with the owner of the Minnesota Twins, and he was friends with Sean Connery. A strange story. But anyway, <laughs> later found out Sean Connery's dentist was in Minneapolis. But anyway, Sean Connery came to Minneapolis to visit Robert Redford, who was uh, directing the film Ordinary People. And someone hired my mom to cater the party. So I was there. I was a little girl. And I was uh, literally serving Sean Connery, the original James Bond, dumplings and wontons. And I was like, my knees were buckling. And Robert Redford, pretty cute. He was really quiet. But anyway, Sean Connery, completely uh, blown away by my mom and so charmed with, you know, just the way my mother handled herself. He too invested in my mother's first restaurant. It's a crazy story. Uh, So once word got out that he was an investor, plus she had grown quite a big following, it was a huge success. She opened more and more restaurants. And by the early 80s, she had actually over 30 restaurants and uh, General Mills bought her company and made her president of the division. And meanwhile, my mother never even went to high school, you guys. She'd been making 50 cents an hour as a seamstress and (laughs) never even went to high school. And she's running this company within General Mills. 
Um, and then she decided to buy it back and uh, grew a chain uh, to over 50 locations, which still exists to this day. So I grew up working in the basement of this catering operation in our tiny home in Minneapolis. And at this time, my mother didn't even have a car. She had to take the bus. Okay. But we're all, you know, we're this army of little sous chefs and all the other kids were at the mall or ice skating and we were forced to, to cook. So I vowed to never work in the food industry. And I was like, I'm getting out of here. It's freezing cold. And at the time there's like no Asian people. So I moved to Boston for college, moved to LA, worked in the entertainment industry for 14 years. And then one day I decided to throw a dinner party but I had completely forgotten how to cook. So I kept calling my mom and asking her questions. And she was like, this is a ridiculous. So she got on a plane with frozen lemon chicken. She showed up on my doorstep. She cooked the whole meal, but she let everyone think that I had cooked it because she was just that kind of mom. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And um, she was so distraught that I'd forgotten how to cook. She set out to teach me how to cook again through a series of dinner parties. And my friends were like, you guys should do a book together. You make it so, look so easy. And I was like, we should do a book together. So I decided to change my life altogether. I quit my job as a senior VP at Fox. I left my then husband. I like had two assholes, one to my right, one to my left. So I got rid of <laughs> And I just thought, you know what? If not now, then when? You know, I just decided to take the leap and we went on to have a show on PBS together called Double Happiness. And we got to go to China for the Food Network and uh, do all these incredible things together. So I'm so, so grateful for that. Wow. Amazing. And your life, talk about coming full circle. So you start with your mom. You obviously do that thing where you're like, okay, I'm doing anything but what she's doing. And then here you now join your mom and become this amazing chef. And now you're doing it with your daughter. I mean, talk about, you know, continually passing this down. So now you and Becca have a show together as well, which is incredible. Well, you've been one of our special guests. So uh -huh. I have twins, but my 13 year old daughter, Becca, during the pandemic, I couldn't cater, obviously. So I just looked at her and I was like, hey, you want to do a show together? And she was like, OK. <laughs> so we just on a lark started a interactive live stream show on Facebook and Instagram. We were doing it three times a week and it was really just for us. You know what I mean? Just to have some fun together. But then we started growing a pretty loyal following. Uh, we got some sponsors and people just love Becca because she's so honest and real, like no filter. I mean, she rolls her eyes at me. She bosses me around. And my, it's funny because my <laughs> when my mother became my boss, you know, and I had some real sharks working, you know, at all these different film studios. She was she was extremely, um, let's just say she had high standards for herself and for me and quite exacting, right? So my husband is like, it's so funny because on your show with your mom, your mom would boss you around and now Becca bosses you around because she's like large and in charge. <laughs> that is so funny. It's like bookends here. You've got the two of them. And I love that they have such different personalities, right? I mean, your mom, like you said, came over, immigrated from China. What was, was it 1956? Yeah. And um, yeah, and started what sewing and, and really from sort of the, the old world, shall we say, without a college education, all these amazing. She was clearly an incredible inspiration to you and to so many so many other people, but to go from that to the United States, which our cultures are so vastly different. And you, you share a lot of stories about like now working with your mom beside your mom and really learning from your mom. So she immigrated. She was what had an arranged marriage with your father. Is that correct? Did I understand that? Yes. So her totally different world. Oh yes. I mean, she basically married my father the day she met him and her parents wow. just left after lunch. Bye. See you later. And that's which um, her parents were wanting her to escape the cultural revolution. So they left one and dumped her off in Hong Kong to get married. So can you imagine? I mean, uh, that I, I really can't. I really can't imagine all of the amazing things that she overcame to get to where she, you know, was. And then what uh, there's James Bond. And then all of a sudden her company is being bought out. And then she goes in and buys it back because was it that she didn't like the way it was being run? It wasn't like her sort of personal touch on it. Is that, can you share a little bit about that story? Cause that's a pretty gutsy thing. All of a sudden, you know, life is sweet. Your company has been bought and what she had over a thousand employees, maybe 1500 at that point in time. 
and she's going into Demo and Lil saying, hey, I want it back because I want to do it my way. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's a it's a common you know story among a lot of founders, particularly female founders. But she just didn't like um, what they were doing to the recipes. She felt that they were making choices that compromised the quality of her food, and she felt so loyal to the community and knew that there was some disappointment. So she, you know, you're right. She was extremely gutsy. I mean, how intimidating and scary to do something like that. But she really, truly had such incredible business instincts and savvy, even though she wasn't, you know, college educated. Um, so, you know, she definitely taught me a lot about, you know, standing your ground, um, taking risks. And this goes so uh, counter to Chinese culture, especially as a woman, you know, you don't speak up, you're not assertive, you're not aggressive, um, you know, you have to use different strategy to get your way instead of being completely overt. So, I mean, she always, you know, she would outwit anybody at every turn. So at one point when her company was worth a million dollars, this was before General Mills, she met with this um, investor and he said, well, I want to buy your company. And my mother said, well, uh, it's worth a million dollars. And he said, well, I'm offering you $300,000. And my mother said, well, it's worth a million dollars. And he said, I rarely give women compliments and I have never given a woman a $300,000 compliment. Oh my God. And said, no, thank you. So she handled every situation with such grace and humility. Um, and therefore she became a huge pillar of the community. So in addition to being this incredible, you know, immigrant success dream, uh, story come true. She served on all sorts of boards like the Minnesota Twins and the Minnesota Vikings. She even threw a fundraising concert at the local PPS station with Prince and Miles Davis. Oh my God. We know who Prince Wow. Was. Like, wow. Play the guitar that Prince. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom sounds like she probably wasn't easily impressed either. More she's just so grounded. And I would imagine that goes back to um, her background, her culture, and starting this show talking about the Lunar New Year and positivity. Just this incredible, positive, resilient um, attitude that she had. So I think I watched one of your the interviews that you had done, and you were sharing um, that your mom was not a complainer. And you're talking about the Lunar New Year and starting the year off on a positive note. Like, she overcame some unbelievable adversity in her life, and she never complained. She never, ever complained. My mother was um, very resilient. And I think honestly, because she encountered so many horrific things. I'll share a story in one second. I think her way of coping and surviving was to just move forward and not look back. You know, just really focus in on uh, being productive and not feeling sorry for yourself. I think moreover than complaining, like, stop feeling sorry for yourself. You know, you're lucky to be alive, right? So, um, you know, I think the flip side of that, though, is she didn't really um, allow herself to feel uh, emotion. Um, for example, when I left my, I've been married three times. I am with a good husband now. I'm my third one. But when I left my second husband, <laughs> She picked me up from the airport and, you know, I was crying and we talked about it a little bit. And, you know, she was just like, you know, you really shouldn't cry so much. It's inefficient. And I'm like, thanks, mom. So, you know, the no complaining, I think, is wonderful advice because we're all so lucky, lucky to be here and to be alive. You know, what's the alternative? But I think in this society, in this culture, living through a pandemic, it's it's easy to fall into that trap. But I feel like it's a waste of energy. And it makes you dwell on the negative and not the positive. Right. It sounds like there's a balance between the two. Um, feel the feelings, but don't get stuck in those feelings. As you know, Americans, we can definitely get stuck in the whining, complaining, and we have it pretty darn good from what you're sharing. You know, there were some major, major obstacles there. And you know, you are, I think of you as talk about a modern midlife reinvention expert. You have, um, I like to think of midlife like a trapeze. You're on like one end and you've got to get to the other end if you're going to take that leap. But when you take that leap, there's this, there's this nut. I think you use the analogy, um, I was a gymnast, of uh, spotters. Like if I was to do uh, like a, a, a handspring on a, 
um, balance beam. I'd have spotters there, right? They would catch me, or you'd have this net that would catch you, but you have to take the leap, and that part in between is really scary. So what do you say to women? There's obviously women out there watching right now who are listening to you and these stories of you, your mother, all the amazing things that you have accomplished in your life, but you've made a lot of changes. You have gone from one end to the other end and had to go through that part where, you know, maybe sometimes the nut had to catch you. Maybe a spotter had to catch you. You fell, but you got back up and you tried something else. So yeah, talk a little bit about that, your experience of taking that leap and for women out there that might be scared to do so. Well, it's a little corny, but I saw, you know, inspirational quote in O Magazine when I was sort of at this crossroads that said, leap in the net will appear. And I was like, you know what? Life is so short. What's the worst thing that could happen to me? Now I had the luxury of not having kids at the time. I didn't have a house payment mortgage. I was living in an apartment. So, you know, I will say I had um, a little more freedom than maybe other people might. That being said, I just thought about it. You know, I grew up working in a catering business. What's the worst that could happen to me? I can get a job. I mean, I was um, raised with really an incredible work ethic. If I have to wait on tables, I'll do it. You know, what other strengths do I have in my toolbox? Well, maybe if my catering business doesn't take off right away, I can do some consulting on the side. And I always, you know, for many years, I consulted for, you know, Fox, uh, Disney, Sanrio for four years, all the while uh, pursuing my culinary career, but it gave me the freedom to do that. It was a means to the end, but I called that my waitressing job. You know, my marketing consulting <laughs> jobs are my waitressing job. But, you know, I always said I'm a really good waitress and it, it allows me the means to pursue all my other dreams. Um, relying on your network, particularly network of female friends, I think has been so important. And a friend of mine uh, said, you know, you know, I'm the head chin strap. We hold you together. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome it's so true but I feel like I don't know about you Catherine but I feel like when I meet a woman um I know within like 30 seconds if she's with me or not with me and if with me like when I met you 100 110 percent all the way and then not you're like okay kind of move on like maybe we'll bump into each other again maybe we'll have some business interactions but but those it's those women you meet where you feel like it's instantaneous bond. And it has just been so fulfilling for me, not only just personally on a social level, but just in terms of my business, you know, I just, um, through the world of women's entrepreneurship day, I have met all these incredible women entrepreneurs. And really the first thing they say is how can I help you? And I try to, you know, I try to do the same and don't be afraid to ask for help. We have to ask for help and we have to, like you said, have those sisters in our back that we can trust and they can be our spotters when we fall because we are going to fall. So how do we get from really a top executive at Disney, at Fox, in marketing? Um, and there might have been a go-go dancing story, I think, in there somewhere, I heard. <laughs> How do we go from that to cooking? And where does uh, go-go dancing in the artist's way? There's a, there's a creative artistic side that you're always tapping into. You've got a super fun, spontaneous personality. So they've got a lot of serious corporate stuff in there, but you are always tapping into your artsy, creative, fun side too. Well, when I was working at Disney, I felt like it was so corporate. I felt like I was suffocating. So I was a go-go dancer at a gay bar at night. And I'd wear all these crazy costumes, like a jack in the box on my head. It was during voguing. Remember that? I would vogue on a bar with this bald lesbian dancer named Amino. Those were wacky times. No, my words, my worlds were colliding because I'd stay at the bar till like for okay. By the way, it was a gay male bar, so it got I got terrible tips, like no tips, like a dollar. I remember one night I came home at like three in the morning, and then I had to wake up two hours later, get on a plane in my little suit. You know, this is back in the early 90s, right? My little silk scarf and my briefcase and um, <laughs> pantyhose, fly to Quaker Oats and pitch, you know, the next Disney movie. And I was like, okay, this is like, I can't do this anymore. But um, I think another reason I decided to take the leap and change my life so drastically is because I really, truly am an artist. Um, 
I'm, I'm a Pisces Aquarius cuss. So outwardly I'm Aquarius inwardly Pisces. And I'm I like, I'm a sensitive art, sensitive artist. And I wasn't tapping into that. And that's why I was so miserable in so many different ways. So when I finally, you know, I really love karaoke. So when I finally left my second husband, my new husband, Matthew, not so new, he, we went to karaoke and I had never sung a solo. Cause I was just scared. I'd always sing with people or duets. And I finally just, I was like, what the hell, who cares? And I just got up there and then one, that was like a pivotal moment for me. Once I got up there and sang that solo, like I, my whole life changed. I just stopped being afraid. I stopped being afraid about what people thought. And that has been so liberating. Once I stopped thinking so much about what people thought, plus just telling my truth. Like I said, my life is an open book. I don't really, I don't really care what you think. I think especially after turning 52, um, don't you feel- there so- is- there's definitely something to that. This whole, I think of Midway as like, it's like a gateway really to your authentic self, to who you truly are, right? And you have this permission, this something that it's like a fire inside that, that Phoenix rising where you're like, oh, okay, wait, I don't have to live my life for somebody else. I can live it for me now. I can speak up. I can speak my truth. Um, and there's this confidence from the inside that and I think that's the world pushing us inward. And as long as I have you on the midlife topic, Let's talk a little bit about menopause, being in your 50s and your mom and your daughter, you're sandwiched in between. So in the culture that we were growing up, menopause wasn't really discussed. Do you remember your mom talking about it at all? She didn't really talk about it. Um, You know, I just remember her going through menopause. She had just opened her first restaurant and she was drinking a lot of chrysanthemum tea because that's a Chinese remedy for you guys out there for uh, menopause, she had terrible hot flashes, but I just remember her sitting in the restaurant, fanning herself with a menu, but that's all she ever said. I mean, she didn't, for example, when my sister needed a training brush, she just handed it to her in a brown paper bag and said here and walked away. So thankfully I have older sisters and one of my sisters is a doctor. So she really um, has, you know, acted like my other mom, as far as teaching me about girl stuff. But I do feel people are still like, I was in a meeting for a consulting job, not culinary related. And I was with two women and I knew them very well, but we're in a conference room and we all just started talking about the subject. But I realized everybody lowered their, like we were whispering as if we were embarrassed to talk about it, but nobody else was in the room. And I go, you guys, why are we whispering? And they're like, I don't know. Why are we whispering? So it's just, it's unfortunate. And, you know, kudos to you and all the work you're doing for us to not be afraid to talk about it and not be ashamed, teach our daughters to not be ashamed of it. And it's just a natural part of life. It's so important. And um, I'm curious as to, because now you've got the younger generations, these younger generations are they're different, right? They're coming in more open. Um, they're aware of so many things that we weren't aware of. So will you have a very different conversation with Becca? Yes, I try to be very open with her. You know, she's, you know, they learned about the birds and the bees in school. And I, I ask her and, and she's like, I, I say, do you, do you want to talk about it? Do you have any questions? No, thanks. But as far as like her getting her period, she's very um, open with me and shares with me. So I, you know, we always try to um, undo the harm our parents did. (laughs) We try to, (laughs) my mother never, I mean, she was incredibly warm, but she just, the way she was raised, like she never hugged us or said, I love you because she just wasn't equipped to do that. So I think I'm overboard. And then also as far as talking about, things like her first kiss or, I mean, I would never tell my mother anything like that. So I'm trying to um, rewrite history a little bit as far as, you know, this, our, our family's immigrant Chinese American story. What an amazing legacy. I mean, obviously your mom left behind an incredible legacy and you are creating one now, a new legacy with Becca. Um, And we'll be right back after a quick break. Now it's time for our Kindra menopause moments. All right, Katie. Well, 
I am 60, you aren't too far behind me. Obviously, we are both um, experiencing all these wonderful hormonal changes. So, you know, I'd love to throw it to you. What has been an experience you'd love to share around menopause or hormones or anything that you'd love to share with us? Well, unfortunately, um, menopause has created a lot of insomnia in my life, which I'm um, unhappy about. But I will say, on a positive note, I was just at a like a crossroads with my script for my one woman show and I couldn't sleep and I couldn't sleep. And I was like, you know what? I just got up and I finished the darn thing in one sitting. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's such a bummer and you're lying there, but you know what? Maybe just get up and do something. What a great idea. So rather than sitting there going, oh, stressing, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. Make that time work for you and make those dreams come true. Amazing. And allow yourself to take a nap. Um, <laughs> That's true too. Right? right. Thank you, Katie, so much for that Kendra menopause moment. So I am excited to dive into health and wellness and food and recipes and potentially hormones. I um, happen to work with a functional nutritionist to get me you know, balanced and feeling better when I was dealing with all the menopausal, perimenopausal symptoms. And I'm grateful now that I have Kendra and all their incredible products. But let's talk about food because, first of all, I love food. And second of all, you make it so fun and simple and easy. You have lots of beautiful recipes in here and incorporate a lot of things like soy, which actually has um, impacts our estrogen levels. So can we talk a little bit about food and menopause and hormones and health and wellness? Absolutely. Well, I also wanted to mention that I'm the um, <clears throat> culinary ambassador to the National Pediatric Cancer Foundation. So I firmly believe in uh, food's ability to help heal, to help us avoid getting cancer, and also to balance out all those hormones, like you said, because it's a, it's a challenging time for all of us. Um, and, you know, I personally have avoided, um, it's HRT, right? Hormone replacement therapy. Yes, and it is. My personal choice, but because I do believe in the power of healthy cooking, healthy ingredients to help balance myself out, um, I, you know, have increased my intake of soy, whether it's tofu or edamame, that's a very healthy way. You know, you don't want to be eating 10 pounds of tofu every day, right? But just being mindful of integrating that more so into your body. Maybe it's just dedicating every Monday uh, to Meatless Monday and replacing that with soy. Also, um, ginseng is another great alternative to enhance uh, and really balance out those hormones. So you could just pick up some ginseng tea. And then, you know, I mentioned earlier, chrysanthemum tea was something my mom used to drink when she had hot flashes. So I think it's, um, first of all, just making some simple changes can really change your life. You know, eating those, I mean, just remembering to eat the rainbow every day. You don't have to eat, eat the rainbow. Just like, think eat about it. Like, did I eat anything colorful today? You know, the more colorful, balance. better. Yeah. Yes. Balance, 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 like you said. And it's not about perfection, right? It's about... I think of food as just a vehicle for feeling better. I mean, I go by my energy. Okay, am I low energy today? What do I need to fuel my body with today? So I love that you offer really simple recipes. And, you know, back to being the culinary ambassador for the um, Pediatric Cancer Foundation, that is unbelievable work that you're doing. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I believe, did you lose both your parents to cancer? Is that it, it, it close to home? Yes. And that's what inspired me to take on this role. It's a volunteer role. Um, I had previously been the culinary ambassador to City of Hope, which is a cancer research hospital, hospital in LA. And that's why I got to go to the White House. But more recently, I've aligned with the National Pediatric Cancer Foundation. And their mission really is to create less toxic, more targeted treatments for pediatric cancer patients. And believe it or not, you know, every day, um, four children are diagnosed with cancer and it's, it's so sad. Um, and, and the millions of dollars that go towards cancer research in America, a very small percentage goes towards um, research for pediatric uh, cancer warriors. One of my most fulfilling um, jobs for the organization is I do a monthly TV segment on Bloom Television uh, based in Florida. 
and I cook along with a host, but then they bring on a little pediatric cancer warrior to cook along with me via Zoom. And let me tell you something about the whole complaining thing. When you go on and do a cooking segment with a little girl that's six years old that has brain cancer or leukemia or whatever, it definitely puts your life in perspective. And that really changes my day because I'm like, so lucky to be here. You know, look at that. What a, what a beautiful thing to do. So thank you so much for the work that you do and, you know, the education and awareness from that. And I think I even um, had seen an interview where you talked about your experience. It reminded me a lot of like make a wish where the kids wish for something. And like, if they want to grow up and be a chef, then you are actually, they kind of walk in your shoes almost. Well, you would love this. And I would love to get you involved uh, with, they have several different initiatives. One is cooking funds, the cure. That's the one that I really uh, spearhead. Then there's fashion funds, the cure. So they have a relationship with Simon malls all over the country and they do fashion shows and the little kids in the market, um, the pediatric cancer warriors tell, uh, you know, the producer what they want to be when they grow up. So if it's a fireman, they walk down the catwalk dressed as a fireman with a fire, a real fireman <laughs> or a chef. I might walk down the catwalk with a little girl who wants to be a chef. And we're both wearing chef hats and aprons. And then the really tiny ones all go down the catwalk, I guess is like butterflies and fairies. But, um, isn't that just amazing? It is amazing. And I know after the show, we're going to weave in some pictures. So perhaps if there are any pictures, maybe Will will have shown you some of those because I'd love to see those. Talk about inspiring. And, you know, also one thing we touched on before was like the artist's way. I know I do the artist's way. I love the artist's way. But, you know, you've taken acting classes or like the go-go dancing, whatever it is. Talk a little bit about creativity and how creativity has opened you up to different things. Well, when I went through that um, big crossroads of my life and left my husband and quit my job and all of that, a, a friend recommended The Artist Way. And just doing the morning pages alone was so helpful because we have, our, our brains are just filled with so much nonsense, so many voices. I mean, I think I might have a little ADD because I'm like, <laughs> I think I'm just a crazy person. <laughs> I have so much happening all the time. Um, and also it's almost just a gift you give yourself to allow yourself to express completely uncensored. And because it's, you know, stream of consciousness writing, you can't, you know, edit or censor yourself. That was really great. And then I took a writing class um, to develop a one person show before my mother, my mother passed away about 12 years ago. So I decided a writing, thank you, a writing class to really document our stories together, her life in China while she was still alive to interview her. And then when she passed away, it was so painful. I put all that work in a, literally put it in a canvas bag, stuck it in a closet and didn't open it until the pandemic. Because again, I was like, if not now, then when? This is a perfect time to revisit it. And that has been just so fulfilling. So I have developed a one person show called Holy Shiitake, A Walk Star is Born. I Uh, love it. I love it. Well, uh, we're developing that with a um, <clears throat> theater in Minneapolis here in LA and potentially adapted for a television show, knock on wood. But writing has just been um, also just such a wonderful creative outlet. And I feel that when I do express myself creatively, it just helps me in every, I'm a better mom, I'm a better wife, I'm a better cook, I'm a better whatever, better friend. Um, so during the pandemic, my husband and I decided to form a band as well. So I'm a singer in our band. It's called Never Too Late. <laughs> and I'm not a great singer, but I love to sing. And uh, we recruited my, I like to call him my gay karaoke husband, Steve. He used to go to karaoke with me all the time. He's amazing. He's our lead singer. And then we recruited some other people in their 50s that had never, had always wanted, say, to play the drums. He's like 53 or whatever. And he's like, I'm going to do it. So he's our drummer. My husband always wanted to play guitar. He's our lead guitarist. Um, So it's been, first of all, it was such a great thing to look forward to during the pandemic. Just something to work on, something to look forward to. And let's face it, when you're singing or playing a guitar in a band, you're not thinking about the pandemic. You're just focusing on what's happening. You're present. I mean, I think that's the beautiful thing too, when you're doing something, expressing yourself creatively, be it dancing, singing, writing, whatever it is, it keeps you present and focused. And like you, I 
can be very ADD. And I think that's a sign of a creative mind with all of this inspiration coming through. And I will put a shout out there. Kinder has a product that is called Focus, and it actually helps you with natural ingredients to stay focused. Because I need focus as well. And the artist way that um, using the morning pages, the brain dump, I think there are many ways to get these things out of our brains so that they, we can focus and we can accomplish all these things. And how do you do all these things? You're a mom, you've got twins, you've got a husband, you are all over the place, five cookbooks. Um, now you're producing a one woman show. You are now singing. You are jetting off the country over to Kelly and Ryan live, which I can't wait to see. But I mean, and cooking with Becca, so many things, your hands in so many pots, the pediatric foundation. How do you do it all? Let's talk a little bit about balance. Is there balance in your life or how do you Try to balance your life. Um. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what? what? What is that? <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's not <laughs> easy. I feel like I need a wife. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, but you have to ask for help, you know, uh, ask for extra help if you, even if that's, you know, having your housekeeper come an extra day because you're really so busy. Uh, I always use the analogy of my life is like a piece of toast, I have a blob of peanut butter in the middle. And I never feel like I get to the edges. Like, I mean, one corner is my kids. One is my, you know, husband. One is work. I just always feel like, oh, I'm coming short a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit there. However, I feel like I need to set an example for my kids, particularly my daughter, that, you know what, if you believe in yourself, you believe in your dreams, you work super hard, you can, you can accomplish anything you want. And sometimes it happens later in life. I mean, truly. Listen, I mean, I was sort of on the coattails of my mother's uh, platform. She had 50 restaurants. She was well known. Um, and uh, so when she passed away, unfortunately, I tried to get a book deal on my own and I couldn't get one. And I was so depressed. Like, <laughs> so I just want to say, don't be discouraged. There's always another way. And I like to say, if one door closes, climb through the window, like find another way. It might not be exactly what you thought, but there's always a different way if you're creative and you, you stick with it. Because again, sometimes the timing doesn't line up with what you thought. So I think also just trying to let go of expectation. I think that's so important too. Um, you know, not necessarily forcing things or accepting things. You can still do the things you need to do, like you said, to go through that window, find that window in the first place. And I think in one interview you had, you had mentioned, if you have a big dream, your kind of actions need to meet that dream, right? Your level of work needs to meet that dream. That window, you're not going to find that window unless you actually take those steps to follow that dream and make things happen, not force things to happen. But to make things happen. Well, Oprah says, luck, the definition of luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And I think that is so true. And you can't dream harder than you work. It's, that, that's what you said. I think that is so beautiful. So your mom left behind a very powerful legacy, one that lives on. Clearly, like I said, you're a little bookend between your mom and your daughter. What do you want your legacy to be for your daughter? Wow. She, my, my mother lives on through my daughter, through this action of cooking, the love of cooking, cooking is storytelling, honoring what we put in our bodies. So for my daughter, I think I would hope that she inherits the same love of cooking, the same joy that we derive from it, that when she has kids, she will have the same motivation and desire to pass it along to her children. Because, you know, that's allowing my mother's memory to continue to live on. So amazing. I love that. And you have a son too, and you have a husband too. Do they cook? Are they in the kitchen? Are they helping yeah. with dishes? Are they, <laughs> what part are they? He's a great cook, actually. He really loves to sous vide and to grill and to um, barbecue and all that. Um, my son has no interest. He's like, I've made him come on the show before <laughs> he hates it <laughs> unless we're making his favorite dishes. I mean, he'll help, but he's just obsessed with video games. So and that's, and I would say that's pretty normal. So um, yeah, unbelievable. So what's next? I mean, you've accomplished so much in your life. What, where do you see yourself five years, 10 years? What's your dream? Like another dream. You've dreamed so many dreams and you've made them happen. 
I mean, ultimately, I would love to um, build a brand where I make money while I sleep. <laughs> and there's never been an Asian American household brand that I know of, you know, in this space. So uh, I'd love to be the Asian Giada one day and have a line of appliances and home decor and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But again, when I came out of the gate, I think I was just like, I want to do this and I want to do that when I changed my life completely. And then I would just get so disappointed. And, but then I think once I had kids and I had these two humans come out of my body, I just sort of let go of some of that stuff. And I think it was maturity as well. Um, so, you know, I've planted seeds, like I said, I've planted seeds for many years and some of them are just now coming to fruition, like 20 years later. So you have to be patient. Yeah. You'd have to be patient. There's divine timing. Absolutely. But then also like, it's never, it really is never too late. I think the world has changed. Um, we're embracing, you know, um, different facets of our lives. I'm not embarrassed to tell people how old I am. You know, I know a lot of, especially in LA, people don't, they don't speak of their age, but I, I think I do. I shout it to the rooftops, just like you. I would imagine you get a lot of, oh, you're not 52. Oh, you're, you're, you're looking pretty young sister. Well, I'm not 52, but this is what I get. Oh, I thought that's what you just yeah. said. Oh, no, I said, I think I was, I don't even remember what I said. I'm turning 57 in February. Oh, oh 50. wait a minute. Okay. I, I literally didn't know your age before. Obviously, we know each other fairly well, but we've never talked ages. And I, when I asked you about menopause, I did not think that, I thought you were in your 40s. So, oh, my gosh. Well, first honestly, of all, thank you, but- uh, my friend Jeannie Mai, you know, from The Real, she's featured in my book. Yes. We always joke around and say, Asian don't raisin. <laughs> you know. As Oprah says, black don't crack. Like, yeah. Like, it's, like it's, a, it's a DNA thing. However, um, what was I going to say? I think, you know, like you, so much of it is your outlook, you know, your behavior. I, I am an older mom, right? So at our grade school, I told all these moms, they were probably like 35, 40. I was going to take them dancing and they thought I was insane because I used to go to this disco club all the time called Giorgio's and into the back of the <clears throat> Hollywood Standard Hotel. And it's all grown ups, like, you know, people at least 40 plus, sort of like Studio 54 of our time. I, I, I mean, that really opened me up too when I first went there with my best friend. I mean, I, it changed my life completely because I had toddlers and I felt like I had lost my life. But anyway, these moms were like, Thought I was crazy. I'm, I'm like, well, the thing is, it starts at 11, and they're looking at me like, are you effing insane? And I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm 15 years older than you are. Like, get a life. <laughs> so funny. Again, it, there's mindset, mindset, mindset. So, and it's not for mastering. everybody. That's okay. But find the things that bring you joy, and I promise you, it will continue to make you feel younger. So what would be three tips you would give women out there to master modern midlife, which is really about mastering, you know, ourselves, mastering our mind, mastering, you know, getting over those uh, obstacles that are in front of us and going, hey, I can do this. What are three tips? Um, feed and treat your body well. Um, yes. Do something that scares you every month. Cause that's going to make you feel alive and it's going to make you feel, um, brave and that you're a warrior. Do Fierce. something that scares you. Fierce. Yeah. Yes. For example, my friend made me <laughs> take this dance class and I had to perform a lyrical dance in front of 300 people. Not going to do that again, but it really, I mean, I did it. I accomplished it. Um, I still suck at choreography, but, uh, it made me feel so great that I accomplished something like that. Um, and then don't forget to laugh. We have to laugh. I mean, it's so therapeutic. You know, so you know those movies you've seen uh, that have just over the years, just put it back in, like just get it from Hulu or whatever. I just saw um, when Harry met Sally again after like 25 oh. years on the plane and you know, her orgasm scene. Yes, was, it's the best, oh. it's the best. Yeah, make the time, take the time to just, laugh or start a cooking show with your daughter that might make you laugh too <laughs> definitely makes me laugh and it also makes me groan <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> her or you or both. <laughs> both. I mean, no, it's it's so wonderful. And I, yeah, what I, I as you know, the start of the show, we hide under the counter and we jump up. So I just so like cute. always remember the 10 seconds before we jump up, we like look at each other. Like we hold each other and we look. And there's just like this quiet moment between us. I can't even explain it. Lately, she's just rolling her eyes at me. Like. <laughs> and again, that's normal. I mean, how many eye rolls did I do um, growing up? I think all of us. That co- that comes with the territory. Absolutely. And so, Katie, you are doing so many amazing things. Clearly, your latest cookbook is fabulous. I cannot wait to cook with you. We're going to be cooking that pad thai. Um, where can people find your cookbook? Where can people find you? I know you're back actually actually doing things in person as well, cooking classes and all. There's virtual, but there's also live in person if people are in LA. That's right. So you can follow me at Chef Katie Chin on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. My blog is chefkatiechin.com. You can find our live streaming show, Cooking with Katie and Becca, on Facebook and uh Instagram, five o'clock Pacific standard time on Sundays. And then, um, I am teaching a series of lunar new year classes at the Gorman D school in Santa Monica, California. Wow. Well, let's make it an amazing, positive new year, right? And all kinds of recipes in here. What is it? Whole fish for abundance. Uh, I'm <laughs> learning all these things. Noodles for longevity, <laughs> for riches and wealth. And I'll just leave you with a couple of fun superstitions on Lunar New Year Day, February 1st. You're not supposed to wash your hair because you'll wash out all your good luck. You're not supposed to sweep because you might sweep out all your good luck. Um, you're not supposed to swear or say negative things because everything you say follows you into the new year. And this is my personal favorite, Catherine. Ready? You're supposed to buy. You're supposed to buy new shoes. Step into new shoes on February first to start your year off on the right foot. Who who knew that I was supposed to go buy new shoes and that would bring me good luck? Amazing! I think I can do that. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> Katie, thank you so much for being with us today. You are amazing and inspiring, and I wish you so much success in your travels out east with Kelly. Say hi to her for me. I certainly will. Back at you, Catherine. Thank you so much. I had an amazing time and happy Lunar New Year to all. Happy Lunar New Year. All right. With that, beauties, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you to Kendra for sponsoring this show and this season of Mastering Modern Midlife. If you love the show, please share the show uh, and let's spread this message and let's help women all around the world learn to master modern midlife by mastering themselves. And you can find all the links for Kendra's products at ourkindra.com and also below. Thank you so much. Cheers, beauties. Stay fierce.